שלום, ג'ים. שלום, רבי, שלום. חנוכה שמח. חנוכה שמח. We have uh, uh, entered the realm of, of light we this have. week, haven't we? It is, it is, yeah, uh, we, are, we are ensconced in the beautiful light of Hanukkah. I have my Hanukkah here, if you can see it. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just have the menorah silhouette <laughs> in the back. I, I, I was telling you earlier, I, I was going to bring my menorah down, but it's full of oil. <laughs> And I'm very clumsy. So anyway. So here we are. So here we are, and um, I, I definitely think that uh, Hanukkah is a, a festival that should be observed by non-Jews as well. So I'm happy, I'm happy that you do. Maybe you can tell us yourself what it means to you, because I think it is, since it is like a later festival, right, um, it's probably something that a lot of people that are kind of on the fence, I know there's a lot of, a lot of wonderful souls that are struggling with... kind of like embracing the Torah. They're coming from a different background and they're, and they're realizing that there's only one God and they're, and they're wanting to emulate the values of, of, of Torah and they're looking at Hanukkah and they're saying, where does this fit in exactly? Because it's not in the cycle of the, you know, the, of the festivals that are described in, in Leviticus 23, you know, like where does it fit in exactly? And I think that Hanukkah actually is, has such a powerful spiritual contemporary message for everyone in the whole world. Well, the, the, the Torah portion this week, Miketz, which is about Yosef becoming the viceroy of Egypt, uh, if, if you look at the Jewish calendar, that occurred in the year 2229, or on the, if you look on the secular calendar, that's 1553 BCE, whereas the Hanukkah celebration, the Maccabean Revolt, This is, this, is how many, this is the span of time we're talking that shows you how Israel has continued this struggle against oppression. The Maccabean Revolt was in the year 3621 on the Jewish calendar, or 140 BCE. So it's a span of, of centuries between these two events, yet they're uh, forever linked in many ways, aren't they? So this is what I'm, I'm going to tell you what Hanukkah means to me, but that's like sure. not so surprising because, you know, I'm a nice Jewish boy. But I, but, uh, I want to ask you as a very, very nice not Jewish boy, what does Hanukkah mean to you? Hanukkah is... This is like um, an essay that I was forced to write when I, was, when I was like in seventh grade, like what does Hanukkah mean to me? Really? Yeah, I didn't have to write that essay. But if I did, I would have said uh, the reason that my wife and I, Carol and I, celebrate Hanukkah is by virtue of being Noahides who have embraced the, uh, the Torah as the truth and truth that has really changed our lives. The fact that the, uh, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, have for centuries and continue this day to uphold this existential truth Hanukkah means that we can be thankful and we also are in, um, we're connected to Israel philosophically and spiritually because if it had not been for the Hashmonians uh, fending off the oppression of the Syrian Greeks, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation today. And, and, and what's amazing about that is, is even though you and I are able to have this conversation, because of, of actually some Greek tenets, some ideas that have been, have been very good uh, by virtue of those same tenets, we're also seeing the people of Israel and the Jewish people being threatened today. So we, we have to do this. We, we do this in solidarity with, with the, the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. That is Very moving, <laughs> very, very beautiful. And the thing is, it's a spiritual battle that, is, that has never um, relented, you know, that Hanukkah, yeah. Hanukkah is, um, it's not just, a, again, we always talk about this, the whole idea of the observance of the sacred times and festivals in the, in the Hebrew calendar is never a lineal thing. It's not about, <clears throat> you know, just commemorating or remembering something that happened long ago, but it's about reliving. It's all, it's cyclical. Time is a cyclical thing in, in the Torah mindset. And there's a few things here that are, that are, um, you know, that Hanukkah pivots on. One of them is 
on the side that you might brand as being like, well, like a activist, you know, like on a kind of like on a political level of understanding, it's about standing up for the truth. It's about it's about um, taking a position in, in uh, that might not be politically correct, that might be not popular, and fighting for it. And in this case, it's the presence of Hashem in the world, and it's the ability for us to sanctify life because the decrees that that the Greek Syrian Empire made against the Jewish people then were decrees that were designed to conceal the presence of God in the world, as it were, to 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 uh, you know to make the make the people of Israel feel that they have no connection to the God of Israel. It was a, it was all about faith. It wasn't about the threat of physical annihilation. It was about this concept of um, is it possible that the that that creation was on purpose, that it was intelligent design, that there is a creator that that put us here with a divinely appointed task. Again, backtracking to the parallel Torah portions of Yosef. Yosef, as I talked about last week in Parshat Vayeshev, is all about realizing that a person has a task that's given to him from heaven, and that is to stand up for, for the values of Hashem. So on that level, the, on the, you know, the geopolitical re- level, it's nothing has changed. In fact, today we see that we're still in a world that is, that is basically dominated by forces of darkness that are trying to mm-hmm. obscure the truth. And it's a, it's a mass confusion. It's a mass confusion that we're up against. So there, there's that idea. And again, if the imagine, like you say, if they wouldn't, if they wouldn't have done anything, what what would have happened if the you know it's like today you and I were talking earlier, the. Uh, the incoming government to be, if, if it ever gets off the ground in Israel, is being described by all the press and by all the pundits and by all the by all its opponents as far right. You know, this word far right that's used basically now is applied to anybody that still has the audacity and the gumption to state that they believe in anything, like family values, uh, the the you know that there's a god in the world that there that there is a purpose to life that's all called far right the the fact that uh, people has a, a divinely a divinely ordained right to live in their land all those things are considered to be far right all of those expressions of basic truths are far right imagine if the the hashmonaim would have uh, bowed to this tremendous social pressure that they were actually were up against then because there was tremendous pressure within the ranks of, of the Jewish people that were Hellenized, that were buying all of the merchandise that the that the uh, Greeks were trying to, to to put over on them as far as the worship of the physical and 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 uh, the denial of of God. Imagine if they would have been branded far right and they would have given up their struggle because they would have said, "This is you know we can't stand up against this the onslaught that's being directed against us in the press and in the and in the." Whatever, whatever the social media was at that time, and I just want to say this one thing about that. There's a very famous statement that our sages make: that the Greeks forced the Jews to write on the horn of an ox, "We have no portion in the God of Israel." It was it was a type of, um, you know, like post, <laughs> you know, a type of tweet or Instagram, whatever you call it. Why, why the why the teaching is based on this concept of the horn of an ox is a very, very deep idea. What that represents exactly, why they chose that as the as the app, as it were, that they said, write on the horn of an ox and show it to everyone. We have no portion in the God of Israel. It was this very uh, devious kind of psychological warfare, psychological manipulation, trying to alienate them from their own heritage. Make a long story short, it was a war against spiritual hope. That is exactly what the the the, the battle of the Hashmonai priests against the Greek invaders was all about. It was about spiritual hope, and honestly, there are so many people today, and this is where where I again I want to address all of those righteous Noahides that want to embrace the Torah of Israel. It's about it's the same battle today. There are the the forces of darkness, the powers that be, are trying to take away hope from this world. It's very very dystopian, very Nietzschean, very very um, apocalyptic, humanistic. Yeah, it's humanistic okay. too. Yeah, 
in the, in the idea of humanistic being the idea that we are our only hope. We have we have no other help, hope for our salvation other than our own our own human wisdom, our own human strength. There is nothing else to help us. The, you know, the, and, and what is so remarkable is there are two things going on right now that are so much of of the the theme and the it, it's a repeat of of the Hanukkah, uh, the state of Israel during the time of the Hanukkah miracle, and that is this this idea of Greek oppression. And here you have the New York Times this week publishing an editorial warning against the incoming far-right Israeli government by Benjamin Netanyahu saying it constituted a significant threat to the future of Israel. And you know why they're, why they're screaming these <laughs> the things? Threat, the threat here's the, here's is the, that there might actually the, be an Israel. There might be an Israel that actually celebrates their, their own roots in Torah because, they're, because part of this is the idea that they're, they're ultra-religious and they're they're talking about the Netanyahu cabinet includes far right parties that are calling for among other things the expanding legalizing of settlements that and uh, also changing the status quo of the Temple Mount where your temple stood and an action that risks provoking a new round of Israeli and Arab violence. Well, by the way, if you know about the Israeli Arab violence, it doesn't take much to get that faction going. You know, you can just, the wind can change on the Temple so, Mount. So the New York Times is very, very concerned because the New York Times loves Israel so oh. much, like a, like a baby that you're holding and cuddling, loves Israel, wants to see it grow up into, I don't know exactly what, but yeah. nothing like it is today. Yeah. But in any event, so the, the, so the danger is this far-right coalition, and so you're describing it's, the editorial is that it consists of people that are ultra religious which basically means people that are religious at all that are actually mm -hmm. so religious that they talk about it in other words when you put god in the center and that's the definition of this horrible word that they're so concerned about theocracy that it's based on that that it's a that it's a form of government that is centered on god god consciousness god's commands god in the world well that that's actually what we are supposed to be. It doesn't mean yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't mean that there that we don't need an army and police and geopolitical and and dip, diplomatic relations and everything else that any country needs. But it means that the priority is the fact that there is a God in the world and that and that we, that is the hope and that we are not haphazard. We are not flotsam and jetsam yeah. in the universe. And and that's very disturbing to all the Antiochus like powers that are still trying to usurp the control for themselves and that's that's why that's why the greek invaders made you know made israel that's the expression of our sages you know based again on the mystery from the beginning of genesis when it says darkness hovered over the face of the deep and the sages say that darkness is referring to the greek exile and the expression that our sages use when they talk about this period of time which is referred to as the greek exile this this period of the, the that, that's covered by the Maccabean revolt and why they revolted, the actions that that that, that, that empire took against Israel by outlawing, outlawing circumcision and Rosh Chodesh and Shabbat and Torah study. The sages say, darkness on the face of the deep because the Greek empire tried to darken the eyes of Israel. And that is a... a, um, a like, kind of like a giveaway to a whole deep understanding of what on a spiritual level what this is all about and to be perfectly blunt and frank and to and to, and to use an overused uh, expression it's about a battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness that's really what it's yeah. all about it's about it's about the light of the shrina in the world or the darkness of human wisdom which again the the, the greeks were <clears throat> um, noted for their beauty for wisdom for the beautification of of uh, the human body for art for philosophy and on all of those disciplines were were predicated on the notion that the world is on autopilot that that the, yeah. that there is no creator but that the ennoblement of of man is the goal you know that that, that and it, and that that is the extent of it it's the it's the physical, it's the demonstrable, it's the tangible, 
whereas everything that the Jewish people represent in Torah is the very opposite. The, the, the real things in this world are intangible, that they cannot be seen, that they cannot be physically demonstrated because they are matters of the spirit. Well, the, the thing that I, that I found remarkable is the, uh, the idea that uh, I was reading uh, Eliyahu Kitov's book, Our Heritage, about Hanukkah, all the things about Hanukkah, and he talks about the concept of that, how the Greeks had turned the idea of, of beauty and, and the beauty and wisdom turning it into ugliness. And I think that as we, you know, people are wondering, well, how do you, how do you connect uh, the celebration of Hanukkah to this Torah Parsha this week about Miketz, about Joseph? Joseph, you know, the, the Torah is, is very um, economic in, in all of its language. And what's interesting about the Torah is it rarely describes the physical aspect of of the of all the characters in the Torah, and the one thing that we know about Yosef, in addition to the fact that he had this amazing wisdom that God had imparted to him in the ability to uh, interpret dreams, and then later we'll see that he becomes an amazing administrator, who who is able to run an empire. It's it's staggering. But he was also a good-looking guy. He was known for his physical beauty. <laughs> And and yet, I don't he, think there's anything embodied, wrong with that. No, what what I'm talking about is that is that the the beauty and the wisdom of Yosef is embodied within the Torah idea of wisdom and beauty. In that there's nothing wrong with being you know attractive, but you know the the point is is that he didn't fall prey to the way an entire empire. Fell prey to they 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 were the worship down of to beauty the, right the worship his, of his beauty his physical beauty uh, he exuded a beauty that was irresistible, and it was a um, uh, a manifestation of his inner spiritual purity. It was it was no. just a question of of like perfection, and it's again it's it's such an incredible synchronization the the portions of Yosef and the Hanukkah story because he is like the perfection of the klipa, as it were, of, of the concept of Greek beauty. And I, I mentioned in our study last week on, in our video on Parshat Vayeshev that this whole concept of his physical beauty is why he was like such a perfect interface, is the word I used, to the, to the material world. And that's part of the whole mystery of how it was that he alone, he single-handedly was able to provide for his, not only his own family, but Egypt, and for basically for the entire ancient world, because the famine was so widespread. And it was all up to Yosef, and it wasn't just because he had some kind of a BA in economics or business administration or something like that, and he just had this unbelievable understanding of... Uh, of numbers, you know, and, and 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 buy, sell, you know, whatever. This whole unbelievable businessman of how he was able to get all of this together—that wasn't it at all. And that's the amazing thing about Yosef, because that because it's what's described in the parsha. This week's Torah portion is that he was able to store grain that until it could not no longer be counted. Right. In other words, he prepared for these years of famine. And he prepared so much that numbers became meaningless. That's how much he was able to prepare. We look at that and think that that must have taken a tremendous amount of acumen because who who knows how to do that kind of thing? Who could be that kind of an administrator, right? But right. it was really something else entirely. It was Hashem. It was Hashem that was with him. Okay, so Hashem could be with through anyone if it's all Hashem. Everything is all Hashem and Hashem chooses a a person to 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 be the representation of what he wants to do in that world but why did he choose Yosef why and so the idea is that he as as Torah testifies to us he was also considered to be the perfection of purity he was also considered to be the tzaddik the one who rules over his own lusts and that's how he was able to withstand the incredible temptation of his master's wife. We just started speaking about it last week, but she was really a troubled person. <laughs> she had she had a, a very, very um, unhealthy sexual appetite, and she really did her very, very best to unhinge him completely. He was 17 years old in all the prime of his yeah. youth with all his, his vitality and power. How was he able to withstand that kind of thing? And not only did he 
but he did so with with a tremendous um, tremendous uh, integrity and 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 power and yeah. so he he exudes this kind of unbelievable purity uh, ironically seeing that he was so attractive so physical that one would think that he could easily just uh, um, become overcome really by 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 his own by his own physicality really yeah and so and so Hazal our sages tell us some um, unbelievable things about this whole mechanism of the preparing for the for the the provisions for the years of famine he saw it all coming and he planned for it and he alone had this ability to save all, save all of Mitzrayim and all of the world and of course all of his family from starvation by storing the bread and no one else could store it and he um that was that was by dint of the of of this attribute of of his of his purity so the Chazal tell us that when Egyptians tried to store their own their own bread it all rotted away it all rotted away in their homes and on their tables it was all like he, Yosef was a magnet because he exuded purity so he was able to keep it all together and no one else no one else, and, and, and and just this one more thing that's also yeah, sure. connect, connected to the fact that it's a strange kind of idea that uh, and it's not so well known. A lot of people are not aware of it. That Yosef had another requirement, and that was that everyone circumcised themselves yes. before and they come exactly to bed. The and it wasn't like the story of Shechem. He wasn't doing any kind of number mm-hmm. here. He didn't. He didn't no. do it. Just and after they healed, they all came, and then they were able to eat the bread because that was really what this was all about. It was. Right. It was, and and that's why the famine came, and that's why Egypt was going under because it was so totally sunk in this horrific licentiousness and Yosef yes. like a, like a yeah. beam of light was able to elevate that gross physicality that 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 you know the the klipa of that kind of like um terrible terrible uh, abandonment to to lust he was able to save them through his own purity despite the fact or because of the fact that he was so beautiful but again, that uh-huh. that just that's part of the whole Mashiach ben Yosef thing. The Mashiach ben Yosef thing is a is a physical device, a physical force, um, uh, uh, to that is able to sanctify materialism by injecting Hashem's presence into it, and by elevating the material and creating the infrastructure and the, and the and the and the logistics that are necessary to support the spiritual revolution, and then onto that scene. Of the of the infrastructure that was created by Yosef or by the Yosefian force in history, then enter Mashiach ben David, who was able to up uplift the spiritual. But first, you have to have a purification of the physical. This is so amazing because this is exactly the point that I was going to make: is that that again is the connection to Hanukkah, is the idea that the the, the Greeks wanted to. Stop, the, or they, 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 in fact, they tried to stop the Jewish people from circumcising their sons, and this is this is the connection to the idea that that they wanted them to give in to the licentiousness because that's what the circumcision, that's what the bread is all about, is is it re, being reminded of the purity of the, uh, the the vessel that God created a, to bring. It's a sign on on the body, it's a, and the, it's a, like that's it's why I always say it's not on the uh, it's not on the elbow, right? And it's not on the edge of the nose because we we are making a statement that that the area of human endeavor that could become the very seat of the unraveling of humanity because it because it has the potential to be completely selfish mm-hmm. we're taking that and we're saying no this is also an aspect of godliness that has to be treated with dignity and respect and even purity and holiness yeah joseph people don't think of of what he had done this way joseph saved the the empire of egypt he literally saved them, not only from starvation, he saved them, as you just pointed out, from spiritual deprivation, at least for a while. And the thing is that we can see this even in the Egyptian historical record. There is a, a pharaoh and there is a, there's a stele on, on the lower cataracts of the Nile. We've talked about this before. And this, this pharaoh, uh, and in fact, the, the first two dynasties that Yosef may have been the prime minister for, the uh, the pharaoh dreamed 
of seven years of famine. And he, he asked his prime minister, who's called Imhotep, what can we do? He, he, and he says, and, and says that prime minister seeks the wisdom of, of the God of Egypt at that time. But what's interesting is that during that same time period of that pharaoh, and I'm, I'm, the reason I'm not calling him today because it's either Yedkare, Yedkare Isesi, or there's another pharaoh. I, I d don't have my notes with me. Besides, I'm an old man and I forget things these days. But anyway, in this time period of this pharaoh who had this dream of seven years of famine and sought the, the counsel of his prime minister, we also find the very first reliefs bas reliefs commemorating the circumcising of Egyptians. Unbelievable. It, it first occurred in that time period. So it's even there in the historical record of Egypt. So that's, like, Egypt, that's that like evidence of Yosef, of Yosef's uh, imprint on history. Uh, of course. Amazing. Yeah. And, and again, flash forward, flash back, flash sideways, the whole comparison and parallel between all of this and contemporary uh, challenges uh, again the 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 whole glorification of meaningless uh, sexuality and mean, meaningless sexual obsession let's call it that we are faced with today and do you know that when you go back to like the the uh, ancient texts that talk about the Maccabean revolt and the whole concept of what the Jews were facing at that time and and uh, and and the Book of Maccabees and all all of the ancient texts that talk about the um, situation. Then you understand that the that the influence that the that this society had on many Jews was profound and devastating. This Helen Hellenization. In fact, the, the the in terms of what actually sparked the whole revolt, it was it was really the Jews who were kind of like. Um, so taken with the Hellenistic notion that they that they were basically attempting to to um, just rewrite the whole nature and character of the Jewish people. They were they're very influenced by these foreign these foreign uh, Israel's New York Times yes. uh, publication in that day. Uh, would have agreed with what, what the Greeks were doing. Yes, and they would have castigated the far right, the far right um, uh, priests. But one of the things that's that's very um, um, st stark and, and very powerful is this description of how there were Jews that were so trying to impress the Greeks and so trying to become Greeks, basically, that they actually tried to undo their circumcision. And there's a whole <laughs> procedure that they describe. I won't get into it now. It's a family show about how they were trying to, uh, how they're trying to mask their, their Jewish identity in that manner, which, again, is kind of a chilling uh, comparison to, to this kind of thing that's going on today. And it's, a, it's, it's all this confusion of identity and it, it's just ricocheting, ricocheting, as it were. Mm -hmm. Well, we were talking about we were talking about some some archaeological uh, evidence of of Yosef, uh, you know, uh, helping the, the being prime minister and and this figure that that may well have been Yosef. Uh, you were letting me, you were telling me about we have some new archaeological evidence of. Uh, the Maccabean Revolt, yes. right? Yes, this is really exciting to me. There's a story that's been out for a couple of weeks now, but we, you and I haven't talked about it. And it, it's really pretty amazing for a number of reasons, but a, a, um, a very important discovery was announced of um, silver coins dating to the reign of Antiochus IV. Apparently this was actually, this was actually uncovered some months ago, but it was you know, in the process of being cleaned and researched and everything. So but the official announcement from the, the Israel Antiquities Authority was made just very recently, kind of in celebration of Hanukkah. In fact, what I'm about to describe is now be, going to be exhibited to the public over Hanukkah in, in this special museum in the city of Modi, and it's called the Hashmonai Museum. So what is it? According to the article, a rare wooden box containing a small hoard of 15 silver coins dating to the reign of Antiochus IV was discovered in an excavation in the Darig Stream Nature Reserve overlooking the Dead Sea. I know you're 
quite familiar with that area from, from your own I know exactly research. where that is because, you know, when I stayed in Israel last time, my Airbnb, I could look out the va- over the valley. This is over where the... Um, the new emb- the the new U.S. embassy is in that neighborhood. You can look down into the valley that leads directly into those caves, and it's a, it's a it's a very popular hiking place. Anyway, I digress. Go ahead. So so the description of the article tells us that it was a very first of all it's being described as a very dramatic discovery. Why? Because it is uh, right from the time of the Maccabean revolt. The box was hidden there on purpose, obviously, and because we'll see why in a moment. The way they found the box was hidden in a cave called the Murabat Cave in this particular reserve. And the date of it is 2,200 years ago. And uh, it was a... The, here, I'll read it to you, okay? It is a unique lathe-turned wooden box that was discovered in a crack in the cave. And when the lid was removed... It turned out that the upper part of the box was full of packed earth and small stones, and below this earth layer, a large piece of purple woolen cloth was found covering the 15 silver coins that were arranged with pieces of sheep's wool in the lower part of the box. So here's the thing. These are silver tetradrachma coins minted by Ptolemy VI, who was king of Egypt at the same time that his uncle Antiochus IV, Epiphanes the Wicked, reigned wow. over the Seleucid kingdom, including Judea. So um, the latest coin in, in the hoard is from 170 BCE, which is basically the beginning of the Maccabean revolt and, mm-hmm. and the war that was declared by the Maccabees against Antiochus Epiphanes IV because of the decrees that he, de- that he de- um, enacted against the Jewish people. So there's a whole idea that the article talks about, like, who hid this box, you know, because apparently maybe somebody was planning on coming back for it, but then they were killed in battle, and it took 2,200 years to retrieve to retrieve the box. And, and by the way, if anybody is interested in looking up the article, uh, just look for the some keywords like the coins that were discovered from the Maccabean Revolt. There is a YouTube video about it as well. But it's being described as very, very unique because... It is, quote, the first clear archaeological evidence that the Judean desert caves played an active role as the stage of the activities of the Jewish rebels in the early days of the Maccabean revolts. So why is this so amazing? Because we have a description in the first book of Maccabees as follows. It's just, it's really, it's it's unbelievable. The description is as follows. Um... Many who were seeking righteousness and justice went down to the wilderness to dwell there. They, their sons, their wives, and their cattle, because of the evils pressed heavily upon them. And it was reported to the king's officers and to the troops in Jerusalem in the city of David that men who had rejected the king's command had gone down to the hiding places in the wilderness. Many pursued them and overtook them. They encamped opposite them and prepared for battle against them on the Sabbath day, and they died with their wives and children and cattle, about a thousand persons. That's First Maccabees chapter 2, verses 29 through 37. In other words, this book, Ancient Record, is basically describing to us that there were groups of Jews that fled to hiding places in these very caves because of the decrees that were okay. imposed upon them. Mm-hmm. So first of all, let, let me share with you now, and hopefully I can do this correctly. I'm always a little nervous about it, and our viewers can see it as I'm showing it to you. Also, Jim, I just want to describe these um, photos, okay? Okay. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. So here's the cave. Can you see this, Jim? Yeah, I can. This is the cave in which the... Um, the hoard was found, this, this stash of, of coins. And here's a very beautiful photograph released by the Israel Antiquities Authority of the coins themselves. And here is the whole kit and caboodle of how they were found in this, in this um, jar hidden underneath this, this fabric. It's quite amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So here's the thing. Just can't, I just can't help it. But where's the Palestinian archaeology? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it's like this onslaught, yeah. constant, constant onslaught of the of this historical uh, lie that's mm-hmm. that we're supposed revision. to revision. 
<laughs> revision, right? That this, we're supposed yeah. to that we are supposed to accept that we are occupiers. That this is a, a Palestinian land. Again, you you and I have discussed this so many times that nobody knows history anymore. But this whole idea of how uh, Israel is constantly being described as colonial and and uh, and and an occupier, it's just it's it's so. It's so staggering to be able to see these unbelievable finds and then to realize that there is no Palestinian history at all because it is a myth, and I know that some people don't like to hear that. But here, I love quoting from one of my favorite Palestinian leaders, murderer that he was, terrorist murderer that he should rot in hell as he was, mm -hmm. but Zohar Mosen, you can look it up on Wikipedia, absolutely, I, I like Marshall McLuhan and Annie Hall, if I had him... <laughs> Just to bring everywhere, <laughs> I would say, here's Zohar Mosin to tell you what I'm trying to say, because he actually himself stated, and I quote, and you can find this article in Wikipedia, which is not known for balanced reporting or, or coverage of Israel, so if they're saying mm -hmm. it, it must be true, quote, he said that there were no differences between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians, and Lebanese, Though Palestinian identity would be emphasized for political reasons. Yeah. And then in a March 1977 interview with the Dutch newspaper Trouw, he stated, I really, I, I wish I had him with me right now. I wouldn't kiss him on the forehead, but this is what he said. He said, between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians and Lebanese, there are no differences. We are all part of one people, the Arab nation. Just for political reasons, we carefully underwrite our Palestinian identity because it is of national interest for the Arabs to advocate the existence of Palestinians to balance Zionism. I'm still quoting. I'm still in the article. Yes, the existence of a separate Palestinian identity exists only for tactical reasons. What a man! Yeah, it's it's why they keep the UN camps open. Exactly, exactly why they yeah. why, why the Palestinian leadership that that absconds and embezzles millions and billions wants the people to remain in, uh, admired and enmeshed in poverty because that's what mm -hmm. keeps the issue alive. But the fact is, yeah. here you have an important Palestinian leader, leader of of the PLO, the, the Syrian pro Syrian Baath faction, who admitted that there is no such thing altogether. And that's why we don't find silver coins from the Palestinian period, period one, period two, period three. That's yeah. why we don't find them. So exactly. it's, it, yeah. it, again, who cares? Does anybody out there, as, as far as the millions and the, and the billions of people that are, that are uh, slaves to the darkness or proponents of the darkness, do they care about the truth? Do they, or will they go on repeating the lies that Israel has to cease to exist in its present form because it is quashing the aspirations, the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. This is this is uh, not something that's being hidden, but it's something that, you know, I guess one has to be able to have the audacity to mention. Yeah. I think uh, another another aspect of, <clears throat> of Yosef's, <clears throat> excuse me, of Yosef's story is that this is something that we have to fight continually. And I, I believe this is also why the celebration of of Hanukkah is is vital for Jews and non-Jews is the fact that in the story of Yosef and and his help to the the prisoner that was with him whose dream he interpreted <coughs> excuse me um, <clears throat> what happened was it the baker I for, I forgot now so what happened the baker goes to goes back to work he's he's back in the good stead and he forgets what Yosef had no, done. No, the other for one, him. the steward, the wine, the wine oh, pour. Oh, the steward. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, the, ba so speaking, the baker was hung. Forgetful. Yeah, the baker was hung. Uh, yeah, the steward goes back, but he forgets Yosef. And <clears throat> I think this is this is the whole story of what happens because because when Yosef dies eventually at the age of 110, which by the way the the prime minister. Who I believe is is called Pathotep, but he's also called Imhotep. Who we have his writings today that have been handed down through the centuries. He thanks he thanks God for giving him 110 years of life, wow. the same number of years that, is incredible, that Yosef Jim. lived. 
and and in fact there was there is a a, a, a saying um, that was handed down through the centuries of Egypt that to attain perfect wisdom uh, and per, perfection in everything is to live to the age of one hundred ten. Wow! So. That's, but almost, that's is, almost what the Jews say, which is that you should live to be 120 like Moshe. Yeah. So the, the, the problem is, is that after Joseph dies, we're going to see in, in subsequent uh, Torah portions, is that what happens? They forget Joseph. Not the Jews, of course, but, but the people who were the benefit of, of his wisdom that came from Hashem, that saved the country, and, and not only saved it for a while, uh, morally because of, of his saying that you can have grain if you become circumcised. Of, of, of bringing about that, that level of purity, all that was forgotten with the passing and, and the, uh, the uh, introduction of a new family of, of pharaohs into Egypt who didn't know Joseph. But you know the famous uh, argument of our sages, either it was a new king who didn't know him or it was a king who decided that it's no longer politically expedient for him to recognize Yosef, so he didn't know him anymore. Either in either case, it's it's so strange because if it was, because even if it was a new king, I mean, how could the memory of Yosef one generation later be totally uprooted when the man single-handedly saved the entire nation? Yeah, I think the sages. I think both opinions are right. I think that it was from from my research. It was a new family. It was a new dynasty. And they, somebody came forward and said, oh, by the way, the reason that we have so many of these, uh, these people that, are, that, that, that have practiced this different religion and this different idea, in, and we even had a prime minister who was not even an Egyptian. In fact, he was a commoner. He'd been in prison. And by the way, this, this, this Egyptian figure uh, known as Imhotep, was known as a commoner who rose up through the ranks to become prime minister. Unheard of, by the way, in Egyptian history at any other time. The point being is that, that they, um, the, the, the sages tell that there was palace intrigue going on and that the, the idea was is that, that the, noble, the nobility surrounding the throne, the rich Egyptians who were... Uh, uh, the uh, people who influenced the crown, they said, you, you cannot keep the idea of this Joseph, of this Hebrew uh, who was in our midst for a while around the country. You cannot let, let his memory be t to sway you. And you just need to forget about it. In fact, they threatened to take away his throne. They, they threatened a coup. And, and that is even remembered in a tomb in ancient Egypt that a prime minister actually uh, tried to take over and actually had the nobility so, around so, I, so do I understand you correctly that you're saying that the historical research that you've looked at would indicate that, the, that it was a new king and mm -hmm. that he actually was kind of like made an offer that he couldn't refuse, like he wanted to remember Yosef, but, he was, but there were other powers that... Prevented it's him not, from... It's not that they wanted to. It's just that they wanted to, they wanted to nip that in the bud. I see. And by the way, this new king, by the way, was, was put on the throne at, at, the, uh, at the age of, uh, I think, six years old. So his mother, in essence, co-ruled with him. So it was easy to manipulate him. So by the time he was an adult, he, he had completely forgotten about this guy. But... A, pri a previous king, whose name I remember at this point, King Pharaoh Unas, uh, if, if you go to the Louvre in Paris today, you can see these reliefs that were taken from his causeway, and the reliefs actually are, show starving foreigners in the, in the procession way that went up to his tomb. He remembered a time when starving foreigners came to Egypt for food. And he would have been, he would have, in, in my research, he would have been one of the pharaohs who either was the last pharaoh that Yosef was prime minister for or, or uh, immediately after Yosef's death, before this new family came in. 
So it gets a little complicated, and I suggest people watch my documentary. This is why people should be listening to our podcast and not the you know the other podcasts that have all these crazy people on them. They should be listening to our podcast because we have a <laughs> professional Egyptologist in house. No, I'm not a professional. I'm a filmmaker who who does his homework. Oh gosh. So. Anyway, don't be modest. I, I'm, 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 I don't want to derail the discussion, but the the point is is that that all these things are, you know, as, as we're trying to point out to our audiences, that, that all these things are an echo of of Yosef and how his own idea of wisdom given to him by his father who taught him the tenets that now became embodied in Torah, the wisdom of Hashem and his beauty were used to save a nation. Exactly. And the parallel is that in the time of the Maccabeans, the Maccabees, is that the reverse happened. They tried to take what they called, what the Greeks called truth and what they called beauty, and they turned it into a tool of oppression against Torah-observant Jews. Exactly. By the way, just a bit of trivia, just still on last week's Torah portion, Mm -hmm. What was the sin of the baker and the chief steward? Why were they in jail in the first place? Why were they being punished? I think one, yeah, I think one, if I remember, the baker, the, the pharaoh found a, a stone or something in his bread. Was that it? So this, so Rashi says, I think, that um, the, uh, the, the baker's sin was that there were pebbles in the, in the, in the bread, and the and the butler's sin was that there was a fly in the in the wine. Right now, that's actually there's always a n numerous levels. That's the, that's one level. There are other opinions that they actually tried to seduce Pharaoh's daughter, and then there's another opinion that they were actually involved in some sort of an assassination plot. But the simple idea is that uh, they each were um, in their particular field. They they made a mistake. Then the question is, how come the butler was forgiven and the baker was hung? Well, I don't know the answer, but I do know that what really got the, the steward thrown in prison is the pharaoh saw the, <clears throat> saw the fly and said, what's a fly doing in my drink? And the steward said, I think it's the backstroke. <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't resist that. <laughs> anyway, so I digress. So the classic, uh, classic commentator, Siftei Chachamim, uh, uh, explains Rashi, and he explains the, the very big difference between a fly and the drink and a pebble in the bread. Mm -hmm. And it's actually be so beautiful, so beautifully simple. Um, he says, uh, a fly could fall into somebody's drink. It's not his fault. A fly, you know, a fly came into the cup. But the pebble in the bread means that he didn't check sufficiently, that he didn't, he didn't um, strain the flour and he didn't, he didn't uh, do his job. And that's, that's the difference. So remember that because that could be the difference between a hanging and a pardon. Just putting that wow. out there. <laughs> so, so Hanukkah and our beautiful Hanukkah lights. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people might be wondering exactly how to how to do it. So, I just like to mention a couple of ideas in in Jewish tradition. Uh, first of all, um, we don't use like an electric bulb or something like that, but. One can use candles and one can use oil with like a floating wick. It's always better to use olive oil since the miracle actually happened with olive oil. Olive oil is also like a brighter, cleaner light and it's much closer to the authentic light of the menorah. After all, this is a commemoration of the miracle of the jug of oil that was found that was sufficient to last until new oil could be produced. And that was, of course, the, the oil that was to be kindled daily in the menorah in the holy temple, the menorah itself had been rendered impure, even even uh, destroyed by the Greeks, and the Hashmonaim had to rebuild the menorah, and they built it in stages. First, they built a very primitive menorah, even out of lead rods, until they were able to make one that was more uh, appropriate. The light should be in a straight line, you know, increasing from the first night one, the second night two, the third night three. We light the new candle first. And there is a beautiful idea about the Hanukkah lights that we don't find really with a lot of the other commandments, and that is that there is a special aspect of the commandment of the Hanukkah lights to display them publicly, that they should be seen. 
um, here in here in the land of Israel, we're we're uh, accustomed to placing them outside the home, even in by the front door, if possible, or certainly in a window facing the street. The reason for this is because there's an idea of publicizing the miracle. That the miracle that happened, we want everyone to know about it. We want to publicize it. There's even an idea that, you know, um, it has to be in a place where people sh- will be going by. And that as long as there are still, let's say a person didn't get to light it on time, which is which should be, let's say, right around the time of sunset or perhaps half an hour after sunset, according to some people, and it should burn for like a half an hour after, until at least a half an hour after the stars come out. And the idea is that is if a person had to light it later, they can, light, they can light it as long as there are still people outside because it has to be seen by, by others, this, con- this concept of kind of like um, broadcasting, the idea of the miracle. And that has a lot to do also with the core idea that this is a time of miracles, that this is a time of miracles in potential, not only the miracle of the oil that's revisited, but it is a, it is a time when... Uh, the miraculous is tangible and accessible. And that's another idea of the connection for all people, Jews or Gentiles, that everyone has the ability to really kind of connect and latch on to this tremendous, resonating, miraculous broadcast. And thus we have an idea that, first of all, Hanukkah is considered to be like the final sealing of the judgment of the High Holy Days. It's like this whole period, even though Sukkot is behind us and Tishrei is behind us and and we've advanced so far along the calendar, there's still this idea that the gates of Teshuva, of repentance, are still open. And Hanukkah is like, okay, Hashem is like so compassionate. He's like, I told you I'm going to I'm gonna write it on Rosh Hashanah. I told you I'm going to seal it on Yom Kippur. I told you to, to make, do your best to overturn the decree and work on yourselves between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Like, okay, that's it, Yom Kippur, it's sealed. <laughs> I say, well, actually, you know, because he loves to give, give us another chance. So this is it. This is it right now. And the idea being... Also, that there is a tremendous release of spiritual energy on Hanukkah because of the fact that originally in time, don't forget that in the desert, the desert tabernacle was actually completed on the 25th day of Kislev. That is way, way, way before the, gen- the generations that we're talking about now. And even several generations beforehand, the prophet Haggai, his very last prophecy was on the same day. And so... When the Hashemunayim defeated the Greeks and rededicated the the uh, altar, it's all like a pattern in 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 divine uh, synchronicity that this also was able to be done on the twenty fifth day of Kislev. It's a day that, from the very beginning of time, was singled out for this prophetic fulfillment of of releasing this kind of energy into the world, and thus it is connected also between the twenty fifth of Kislev the time that the Desert Tabernacle was completed, the prophecy of Haggai, the time of the Hashmanaim, and also to the future. And and thus, it, there is this idea that when, why, why are the Hanukkah candles so special? Why are the lights so powerful? Again, this idea that when they're burning, a person should sit and gaze into the flames. And it's it's not easy to do because you'll be tempted to be distracted you know you're not supposed to eat by the by the candles like you'll go out with your coffee and donut no or even to yeah. or even to uh, check your messages on your phone or even to read no you're supposed to just sit and let the light fill your entire field of vision you can pray also quietly during that time but the idea is that the light is so pure because it is a <clears throat> reflection of the hidden light of creation that whole idea that that hidden light of creation that God originally created in the world was only exposed as it were for 36 hours for Adam in the Garden of Eden and then Hashem hid it for later but now every time we light the lights on Hanukkah the, a little spark of that hidden light which is going to be revealed in the future rectified world it's revealed through the light of the Hanukkah flames and it's like the the original light emanating from the Holy Temple. And so there is a teaching that the smallest, most average person on the night of Hanukkah can ascend to a level higher, spiritual level higher than that of the high priest in the Holy Temple simply by gazing into 
the lights, and it is an opportunity for cleansing. That's the thing. First of all, it's a tremendous opportunity for prayer. During the time that the, that the lights are burning, you know, people should not be doing other things. They should just enjoy that light. But we've all seen things that we're sorry that we saw. Let's face it. Things that, what is the expression that you can't unsee? And, and uh, it affects us, you know, but, the, but this is like a once-in-a-year opportunity to bathe our eyes in perfect light, in, in perfect cleanliness and, and purity. So it's, a, it's an eye wash. It's an eye, a spiritual eye wash that, is, that helps us to rectify our attribute of vision. And who wouldn't want an opportunity like what I'm describing here, ascending to the highest possible spiritual level. Is, you know, so I just want people to know it's not about spinning the dreidel, nice as that is. It's not about potato latkes, very nice, and make sure that you eat it with sour cream and applesauce. It's not about jelly donuts. That's like a 1,000 calories each. It's all wonderful. The main thing is the light, for goodness sake. The light is so beautiful, and it's within our reach and it's a and it's and, and why why is Hashem giving us this opportunity? Why this opportunity for such purity? All of us, Jews, Noahites, everyone who loves Hashem, because what it kindles within us, it's like it's giving a message to our own soul that we too should be inspired to do the same kind of thing that they that they did to stand up for the honor of Hashem and to take a stand for what's holy in this world. That's really what it's all about. And again, it's, it's not a very, a very uh, far cry. It's not a jump to understand that in the context of our current milieu, when the same kind of spiritual warfare is being fought, is being waged against those who have the audacity to believe in, in one God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's us lighting the menorah, the Hanukkah light, and like, like the Hashmanayams, it's it's our way of rededicating ourselves to to, to the truth of Hashem. I think it's a, literally a wake up call for a person's own yeah. soul to 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 be rekindled and to connect with with the source of that divine light. Amen. So it's re, it's really an opportunity and it's really a, a privilege because it's like it's like a a um, a taste of the eternal light of Hashem that's coming into the world, and it's it really strengthens our our faith and it really illuminates our inner consciousness to be able to realize the power of this light. And another thing about living today, which we all are, I suppose, is that these are days of tremendous darkness and anxiety and fear. And, and um, it's, a, it's a common malady because that is the, is the toolkit of the, of the power that is arraigned against those that are trying to make this stand. Hanukkah and its light is the cure for that kind of um, challenge. It, 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 we all have a lot of anxiety, and Hanukkah basically cleanses from all of these places that are holding us back. And, and that light has the ability to elevate us abo above the common doubt and fear and sadness that is basically being beamed at us all the time, that is trying to lobotomize us and take over our consciousness. Amen. There's a, an unusual aspect of the of the festival, really, is that you know the the ancient sources all talk about the military victory of the Chashmonaim, how how great it was, and in fact, even in the in the special prayer that we recite. During Hanukkah, we talk about the miracle of the fact that these these holy priests of the Holy Temple were so hopelessly outnumbered. They were not military men; they were just a few people. It's certainly that's how it began in the beginning of the rebellion, and it was like ridiculous odds for them to stand up against this empire, and yet they succeeded. and And that military victory seems to be so much a greater miracle than that little jug of oil, whatever happened there. And so why is it that everybody knows about the oil as the emblem, as it were, of the, of the Hanukkah miracle, and we don't emphasize the military victory? And one of our, our holy uh, sages, the Maharal, talks about this, and he says the reason for that really is is because when you talk about the military victory, you run the risk of starting to think that maybe this was 
um, just the prowess of those people and their own bravery and, and, yeah. and ingenuity, you know, and that they were able to to figure out how to do this. Just just as Yosef was not an economics major and he was not a manager. He didn't go to business school and he knew nothing. I promise you, he knew nothing about administration and yet he succeeded in saving the entire world from famine. So too, these men had no idea what they were doing in terms of their military knowledge. And if, and and by and by emphasizing the miracle of the jug of oil, what we're really emphasizing is where these victories came from, that there's only one author, and that was and that it was Hashem's hand in everything. Right. And and that, that was the ma- that's that is the major idea here, that it's all Hashem. And that he he uh, orchestrated all of these unbelievable uh, upheavals. And yeah. that was Joseph's uh, charge to Pharaoh. He said, he told Pharaoh, you need to find a man who is full of the wisdom of God. And not even tuning his own horn, he didn't even think that, that he, would, he would be appointed that. Because what's so wonderful about the, the, the lesson from Miketz is that Yosef stayed those additional two years because he needed to finally come to the idea and he, he finally needed to embrace that I am not in charge and everything that is happening is happening because of Hashem. It's not me. It's not my strength. It's not my ability to dream because God gives me the ability to to tell you what these dreams mean. And it's so unbelievable because he's just been through so much. He did an additional two years. He's sitting there for 12 years. He finally has his chance and he has the stage. And the first thing is, this is above my pay grade. Hashem will answer you. God will answer you, right? Right. That's the first thing. And then... The other thing that is so unusual about his performance here, and we haven't even talked about the the parsha yet, but you know, the first thing that he sa- that he says after he interpreted the dream, which which found favor in Pharaoh's eyes for for many reasons. One is because it was the truth, and because he Pharaoh hadn't been telling the truth about exactly what he saw. That's another story. But then Yosef goes and he does something that is extremely unusual and hard to understand given the circumstances and his station. He gives unsolicited advice. It's a strange thing. Like, right. you know, he's a little bit pushy here. <laughs> you know, it's a little chutzpah. Like, like, like Pharaoh says, uh, what does this all mean? And then and Yosef says, now here's what you should do. I didn't ask you what, you, what I should do, right? And then Pharaoh's like, whoa, right. is it, this is like, I've never seen anybody like this. Is there anybody that has the spirit of God in him like that? But why did Yosef make that move? Why did he take that chance as it were why did he give such uh, unsolicited opinion he actually gave him a plan of what should be done now and I think that I think that the answer the simple answer is that is that um, and I, as again as I mentioned in the in our Torah video last week it's the same reason why Yosef actually had the audacity to tell his brothers that they're going to be bowing down to, the, to him and that created all yes. this friction because they thought that he is really stuck up and he's just lording it over them and all he, it's so haughty of him and he wants attention and what you're going to that was not Yosef's intention at all Yosef understood that he had been given a task from heaven and he's and, right. he, and like I'm sure that when Yaakov said to Yosef what are we going to come and bow down to you and Yosef's answer is not recorded but Yosef's answer was, yeah, absolutely, because that is what this is all about, because I am preparing the way for you. It's not me. It's Hashem. Yeah. So, so, he, yeah. so, so uh, that's what I was, you know I was, why, try, I was trying to you know, say. You know, Rabbi, the why is because his father taught him the value of understanding a, a dream that comes from Hashem. His father had his own experience. Dreamer, with, the son the, of a dreamer, exactly. Yeah, exactly. so the, he's just... He is a reflection of his father in so many ways, and and uh, he was and he knew the story of of uh, his grandmother, and how she had sought this this uh, uh, like why are these two battling within me? What's going on? And his his grandmother kept it in her heart, what what uh, the, the mission was. So Yosef, he finally he must have it must have come to him finally in those those last two years in prison. Like aha. Uh-huh. You know, and that's is, uh, why he had he had that audacity to be to take that initiative with Pharaoh and tell him what to do because he understood. That's why I mentioned about you know bowing down to the brothers. He understood he has a job here. In short, he's a fixer. 
Yeah. He's a fixer. And that's, again, another parallel to Hanukkah because there's so many parallels. It's so, it's so powerful, the connection between Yosef and Hanukkah that we always, you know, besides the fact that Pharaoh saw about seven stalks of, of, uh, of corn, ears of corn coming up, and there's so many hints to, the, to this synchronicity. But Yosef understood that his job is to try and uh, forge a path, yeah. forge a path of, of salvation. That's exactly the story of Hanukkah as well. Because they also could have said, "This is beyond us. This is not something that we can, that we can uh, confront. We can't confront this empire." And yet they took the stand that they took because they knew that it was up to them. And that again, that is that is a message of Hanukkah that should resonate for everyone here in this in the darkest time of the year, you know, the, the longest nights, and this is literally lighting up the darkness that we are that we are uh, facing today as well and that and that's why this that's a holiday has such a tremendous appeal to everyone even so-called secular Jews and I don't use labels and I don't label anybody but there are Jews that label themselves secular right there is no there's no secular Hanukkah Hanukkah is not a secular holiday they might no. th- they might people might think it's just a cultural thing it's nice to spin a top and it's nice to eat you know very very fattening foods and that kind of thing and it's a nice get together. It's a parallel to Christmas. <laughs> Who knows what people are thinking? But the truth is, Hanukkah is a deeply spiritual celebration, and I'm sure that that enters into the heart and soul of of every person who observes Hanukkah on some level, however consciously and however subliminally. the The heart cries out for this time of year because it is such a such a uh, powerful strengthening of faith. Faith yeah. tempered with action. I want to, I want to add one more, just one more thing, and and before we wrap it up, and, and that is, is that um, it, it's remarkable this connection between Yosef and 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 Hanukkah that I don't think a lot of people have realized before, but you know, you talk, you went on at length about the value, the real value of of you know uh, basking in that flame, of of the Hanukkah light, and uh, I, I, it recalls. What the prophet Yovadia said about about the the end times, and that is, if the house of Joseph would be aflame. And I I I can't help but make that connection. You're right, that's so beautiful. That's that's actually yeah. a Hanukkah reference. That's mm-hmm. a Hanukkah reference. That because Yosef is the flame during these weeks, and Parshat Miketz is is so kind of like um, shrouded in mystery, in a way. Because mm-hmm. it's it yeah. chronicles Yosef's rise to power, and it's so things are happening so fast, and it's all about the brothers coming down, and Yosef's behavior towards his brothers is the predominant uh, uh, concept, you know, that we're that we're dealing with in this parsha, and it it ends with such a cliffhanger because Yosef has a plan, and again, this is not. This is not uh, the Godfather. <laughs> this is, we're not we're not reading about revenge, and we're not reading about getting even. We're reading about a man, Yosef. He's a man, a tzaddik, who understands that Hashem is with him, and understands that. that and I, I mentioned the last again in last week's Torah video. Yosef, Chazal say Yosef had ruach hakodesh, divine inspiration, Hashem's hand on him from the time he was born until the time he died. He everything about him was totally steeped in. A personal relationship, personal faith in Hashem, and Yosef understood that it was incumbent upon him that it, it it he had a task that was given to him by God to teach his brothers about unity. It's the it's yeah, the it's exactly. the culmination of and the fixing of the theme that's been that's been bothering us and recurring throughout the entire book of Breshit, and that is brotherly enmity. Yeah. Yosef fixes it. Once and for all, in 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 his story, and again, the yeah. the whole book of Genesis is we're dealing with these, you know, absolutely supernal themes of of the foundations of everything for all time, mm-hmm. and and whenever we have these parshas that are that are uh, inf- that are emphasizing individuals and relationships and and everything that they did and all the things that they went through, it's because patterns are being established now that will be resonating and leading us to the ultimate redemption. Yeah, even the name of the Parsha, Miketz, it, it, it alludes to the end of things. To the, and it, so the, it's an allusion. The whole events of this Parsha are 
uh, a key to understanding the the redemption, the the redemption to come in in days, and may it come speedily. And I see, and obviously, Yosef is a kind of Mashiach. He saves the Mashiach ben Yosef. Mashiach ben Yosef, and it, it even it even shows us that possibly when this figure arrives, that that his own Jewish brethren won't even recognize him at first, exactly. because he'll seem so uh, maybe Western in his ideas and his dress, and they'll think, well, who who is this guy? And they won't even recognize him when he arrives, even though he's standing right there in front of him. Yeah, exactly. That is so unbelievable. So true. Yeah. So it's good to see you. And uh, it's good, good to be to seen. See, good to see everyone. And uh, bless everyone with a beautiful, beautiful light filled Hanukkah. Keep looking into that light and drawing strength and inspiration. Have some quiet time and ask what the flames are telling you. Get your mission from Hashem to delve further into the light. And. Um, just a wonderful opportunity to come clean and feel Hashem's presence in everything. Again, it's a time of potential miracles, miracles for all of us. And that is a special time of prayer while the lights are burning. And that all the gates are wide open. This is it. Don't waste the chance. And have a wonderful, wonderful festival of light. Shalom, Amen. shalom. Hak Shameach.